exactly uh, what we're going to look at today. Um, we're going to start where we stopped two weeks ago before we um, talked about the Passover items last week. And I'm going to have that up on um, the internet this, this tonight if you need to look at that. But we looked at all the Passover items last week, what they represent in Israel and what they mean to the believer. Because the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And you, you have to have both of them. And what we're talking about in Colossians, remember what we're talking about in Colossians is there was, a, there was something revealed to Paul, and if you want to go ahead and turn to Colossians chapter 2, there was something revealed to Paul, and, and it was called Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that is called a mystery. It's one of the seven mysteries. Remember God in the flesh, Christ in you, Christ in the church, the uh, rapture of the church, the restoration of Israel, uh, the mystery of iniquity, and the whore of Babylon. Those are the seven mysteries that had been revealed to every believer. Now, the Catholic Church says that the Pope is in charge of the mysteries, and only he knows what they are, and that he speaks ex cathedra at times, which means in place of God or for God, and he holds the keys, there's keys, cross keys on his um, lapel, on his um, robe, that means he's the holder of the keys, the mysteries, and that's a bunch of baloney. Because those keys were given to Peter, and he they call Peter the first pope, and that those keys were subsequently handed down to all the uh, subsequent popes. Well, that's not biblical at all. The mysteries were given to Paul, and Paul reveals those mysteries, and one of those mysteries is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have a privilege that no one had prior to the church age, and, and they're not going to have during the tribulation of the millennial kingdom. You, the bride of Christ, are who this is talking about. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because at the rapture, the Holy Spirit goes. And during the tribulation, it's reverting back to what it was in the Old Testament, because the seven-year tribulation, called the time of Jacob's trouble, is happening because God wants to restore His wife, Israel. So everything reverts back to the way it was prior to the church. But right now, from the ascension of Christ until the rapture of the church, that period of time, which I believe we're, we're approaching quickly the end of that, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now we want to understand what that means, and even how you get it. I think, I think Christendom, right, we've got to understand this, inside Christendom, I think there is a big misunderstanding of what it means to be a Christian. I think a lot of people, and I've talked to them, you know, when you talk to them and you start discussing things, it becomes pretty evident something's wrong in their relationship with God. Because salvation is not saying a prayer. Salvation is not going to church. Salvation is not tithing. Salvation is not being a good person. Salvation is not doing good deeds. Salvation is a circumcision of the heart. And I don't think people really understand what that means because when they said that prayer and they got baptized and they start coming to church and they start doing good things, to them that equates to being a believer. I'm having a discussion with a fellow on Facebook right now that he thinks he's saved, but by his answers he's not. And I'm trying to help him understand what a circumcision of the heart is. 2 Corinthians 5, 2 and 1, For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, Jesus, He knew no sin, that we, sinners, might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So it's all through Christ. It's nothing that we can do. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. So Christ in you, the hope of glory, it's not part of the law. You don't fulfill the law to get saved. Christ nailed all that to the cross, and now it's through a relationship with God. Christ fulfilled the law. So it's without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Because remember, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, because it's the Christ. You don't get saved a different way, a Jew and the Greek or Gentiles. They all now, through Christ, get saved through Christ. 
Because they were teaching the Judaizers that you have to keep the law and add Christ to that. He said, no, 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 there's no difference. The law has been done away with, and the Jews have to come to God the same way the Gentiles do in the church age, and that's through Christ and Christ alone. That's what this is talking about. For all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned. Everybody. 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 Every person since Adam has sinned. Will sin. Will be a sinner. And because of that, we're condemned. And the only way to be uncondemned is to believe that Jesus is God. He came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross. He shed His blood and He rose from the dead so that we can have a relationship with God. And when we truly believe Him, that He is the source of a relationship with God in our heart, we have a miraculous circumstance that takes place and we are, we are made alive. We are quickened. Our heart has been circumcised. And we're going to look at what that means specifically today. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. That means satisfaction. Who is our satisfaction? Jesus. Not your good works. The Bible says all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So your good works did nothing. They do nothing. They accomplish nothing except being a powerful witness. It doesn't make you saved. It doesn't get you to heaven. Doing good once you're saved accomplishes a powerful testimony. But it does not accomplish anything as far as getting to heaven. Okay? That needs to be clear to anybody who comes to know Christ. Your good works don't do anything to make you more or less saved. To declare, it's through His blood. It's through His blood. And I keep asking this fellow, what is so special about the blood of Jesus that when you believed in Jesus, it quickened you. It separated your soul and your spirit and made two out of them. And now you're a trichotomy, not a dichotomy anymore. What's, what was so supernatural about the blood of Jesus? That without it, we can't have life everlasting. And what was supernatural about that blood, that just by truly believing, it quickens us. To declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Declare means a token of proof. The empty tomb, the blood of Jesus, is a token of proof that what He said was true. You cannot find the body of Jesus. It's gone. And if you say it was stolen, then you have to go to those guards who were in charge of watching the tomb, and it, he, their lives were at stake if they let someone steal the body. But we all know what happened. An earthquake happened, and the angel came and rolled the stone away, and Jesus rose from the dead and walked out. His body wasn't stolen. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Every privilege and blessing we have as a believer in eternity future is only through Christ. Nothing through us. Everything we accomplish from the time we accept Christ until the time we go to heaven is to be done for the glory of God so that we can have a powerful witness and that people may believe what we said. But here's our goal. Our goal is that people where we live, work, and play one day will not come before the great white throne and say, why didn't you share this with me? You had the truth and you didn't share it with me. I don't want anybody to be able to come before that throne and I'm going to be there and you're going to be there. Every believer's there. Because the Bible says one day we're going to judge angels. When do the angels get judged? The great white throne. And we're going to be the wife of Jesus then. So when these people approach the throne, we're there. And my goal, my personal goal, and I think it should be the goal of every believer, is where we live, work, and play, is anybody going to be able to approach that throne and say, Whoa, you're there? Why didn't you give me a chance to say no? That's love. That really is. It's love. It's, it's love is giving them an opportunity. And if they say no, they say no. But give them the opportunity. That should be the passion of our church. See people saved, mature them, and keep the process going. According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, remember that, that principle is based on foreknowledge. 
God is omniscient, which means He knows all things. I don't understand that, but the Bible says He's omniscient. I cannot put my mind around that. What does omniscient mean? All-knowing. All-knowing. Which means there's not an event that happens in the universe that God's not aware of, intimately. So what this means is, God already saw the choices you would make. So you were the chosen because He knew, He knows already that you chose Him. You were chosen before the foundation of the world because He saw before the foundation of the world who would choose Him and who would not. That's foreknowledge. You cannot separate the principle of predestination, God's plan for your life, from His foreknowledge. Because His foreknowledge is the engine. That's what makes everything happen. So according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him. His predestined will is that we should be holy and blameless. But every believer doesn't meet up to that. Why? Because they have a free will. He doesn't make you be holy. He gives you the opportunity to be holy. But it's His goal, it is His plan, the Bible says, that you be holy, but He knows if you're going to be holy or not having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, because He already knows it, to the praise of the glory of His grace, when He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. He, through Jesus, and through our acceptance of that, has made us accepted in the Beloved. Now, the, the death of self gives us life. We're going to go past this. Number two, we die through spiritual circumcision. That's what I want to get at. Look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11. If you want to go back and read, um, we read this last time, Romans 6, 1 through 23. It's a great passage on how to die to self. And those key passages are verses 1, 2, 6, 7, 11 through 13. So we, we kind of ended off there last week, but I wanted to kind of bring us into what spiritual circumcision is. In verse 11 and 12, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So, he's not talking about physical circumcision, but he is comparing physical circumcision of a male that's eight days old to the circumcision spiritually that is done to a person's heart when they accept Jesus Christ. And remember, the male child at eight days old is circumcised because the flesh is cut away, and that is a spiritual picture of the flesh, which in the Bible is flesh a picture of sin. It's a flesh of carnal desires. Even in the Old Testament, when they sacrificed before God, they took the fat and they took the flesh and they burned it. That was not part of the sacrifice. They cut it away and they burned it. Which was a picture of before we can be presented to God, we need to have all the flesh taken out of our life and it needs to be cast out, it needs to be burnt, it needs to be done away with. That's the same principle we're looking here at circumcision. And the reason that the male was circumcised on the eighth day is the eighth day is the new beginning. There's seven days in a week. The eighth day is the first day. It's the new beginning. That's why many churches worship on Sunday. It's not that it's the Sabbath. It's not. Saturday's Sabbath. It always was a Sabbath. It always will be the Sabbath. But they use Sunday as a picture of the new beginnings. Okay? So you can't link that with the Sabbath. All it is is a picture of new beginnings. So that's what it is. The male on the eighth day was circumcised. The flesh was cut away, which is a picture of spiritual circumcision. Because remember, in Romans 1, everything physical is a picture of the spiritual. If you look at it hard enough and you study it, everything physical, everything God made, everything God made, people who study biology and people who study science should be able to see God so clearly if they look at it with an open mind. But everything Romans says, everything God made was made to reveal spiritual truths and even reveal the Godhead. If you look at it and you understand the Bible and you understand creation, Verse 11 and 12, circumcision made without hands, so he's comparing physical to spiritual, and putting off the body of the sin, so he's saying, if when you get saved, you're having a spiritual circumcision of the heart, and the desires of your life, if you truly have accepted Christ, the desire of your life is to put away hatred, is to put away malice, is to put away sin. We don't always do it, but the more that we daily submit to Christ, and the more we daily get into the Word of God, and the more daily we live out the Word of God, the stronger we will become, the Bible says, work out 
your salvation. It doesn't mean you've got to work to be saved. It means work it out. It's like someone running or someone working out. Why do you work out? Why do you run? You want to be strong. You want to be fit. So work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So if we're working out our salvation and we're studying the Word of God, we're memorizing the Word of God, and we're applying the Word of God, that means that we are working it out. We're becoming a strong believer so that our testimony can affect other people. We're not doing good to be saved. We're doing good because we're saved and we want our testimony to be seen by others. That's what is happening. If you truly accept Christ, a circumcision of your heart is taking place and the desire of your heart is to put it away. But that sinful flesh, here's the thing, that's why I talk about the zombies so much. That sinful flesh never dies, it's always there, it's always alive. And the one you feed the most will be the strongest. If you feed the fleshly desires, and you can do that as a believer, that's going to become strong. Or if you don't feed the spiritual desires, but you're not necessarily feeding the fleshly desires, just not feeding the spiritual desires, the natural tendency of human being is to sin. So if you're not feeding the spiritual desires, you're actually, by proxy, helping the fleshly man to grow. Because that's our tendency. We're sinful. So it's very important that we not just not do wrong things, which is what a lot of believers do. They just don't do wrong things thinking that's okay. But it's important that we feed and we strengthen the inner man and work that out. So, how did that happen? Verse 12, buried with him in baptism, not, not physical baptism, not water baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, wherein you are also risen with him through faith of the operation of God. We had a spiritual operation, just like that physical operation an eight-year-old, an eight-day-old male child has to go through. We have a spiritual operation that takes place in our heart. Remember, the sword is two-edged. One of the sides cuts, and the other side heals. Just like a doctor. A doctor uses a really sharp scalpel, and he cuts. That hurts. He makes an injury so he can heal. And the Bible is called a two-edged sword. Why? It's not an accident. It's too edgy because one side cuts. It exposes. It hurts. But the other side comes along and heals if we'll apply it to our lives. So buried with Him by baptism, just as Jesus died, that's the baptism, just when we, when we get saved and they dunk us in water, it's just a picture. It's picturing our, what happened when we got saved. We are burying the old man and we're raising to newness of life. That's the spiritual circumcision. Baptism doesn't do anything for you spiritual. When you come out of that water, you're not more spiritual. I see some people get baptized and they come out of the water and they go, Woo! And I, I'm glad if they're happy that they're saved. Okay, I understand that. That's not bad to do. But if they're doing that because they think something supernatural just happened, well, I, let me tell you, you got nothing, nothing supernatural. All you did was get wet. All you did is you told people that you believe that Jesus died for you and he rose from the dead, so you're going to die to self so you can raise to newness of life. That's, it's just a testimony. You, nothing supernatural is in that water. I remember I went to a church called the Rock Church in Virginia Beach. A huge church, charismatic church. So I went in there, off on, on, off, I went under, under church service that scared me to death. I just wanted to experience it. So I got, it was kind of weird. And then, and then I went back later and I got their material. And I read it. And they actually said in their pamphlet on water baptism that there is something supernatural that takes place in the baptismal waters. You can't find that in the Bible at all unless you take it out of context. It's just a comparison. So, we die through spiritual circumcision. You die to self when you say, I believe Jesus is the only way to have a relationship with God. I believe that. I believe Jesus is God. He came to this earth in the form of a man so he could be born of a woman so that blood, sinless blood, could be offered. Okay, Jesus had God's blood, Acts 20, 28. He didn't have human blood because Mary was a virgin. And the blood passes to the child from the father. 
That's why you do a blood test on the dad, not the mom. So the virgin birth is 100% necessary for what Jesus did to be effective. Without the shedding of blood, God's blood, there's no remission of sins. That's why Jesus had to die. But He also rose from the dead to prove He was God. So the picture of Old Testament circumcision, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. This is the Old Testament talking about Israel doctrinally, but also believers spiritually. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will I'll put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36, 26. A heart transplant takes place when you accept Jesus Christ. You can look that up in Deuteronomy 10, 10 through 22. And I'm trying to get through this really quick, but look up Deuteronomy 10, 10 through 22. Jeremiah 4, 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your heart. So, even in the Old Testament, the Bible is comparing physical circumcision with spiritual circumcision. And the reason physical circumcision is even there is for cleanliness. Same thing is true spiritually. Get the flesh of this world out of your heart. And once you're saved, you have that spiritual circumcision, but you have to be very careful to keep the flesh away. And that's why Paul says, I die to self daily. I want to get it out. Not to be saved. Not to make me any more saved. But I want my life to be a powerful testimony. That's what it boils down to. I want my life to be a powerful testimony for God. And take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire. Because that's what happened. They didn't remove the flesh from their hearts. They did the things outwardly that they were supposed to do, but they didn't remove the sin from their hearts. And Israel kept falling to idolatry. Because it's not about what you do on the outside. It's about what you do with your heart. They did all the stuff outwardly. They, the, the priest went through all the motions. The people went through all the motions, but they weren't cleaning their heart from the flesh and taking the flesh away from it. And burn, burn the flesh, that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Circumcise yourselves. That, that word means in the Hebrew to cut short, to destroy. That's what circumcision means. It means to cut it out. It means to destroy it. So as we accept Christ, we have an operation of God. He gives us a circumcised heart. He gives us a clean heart. And our daily duty is to walk in righteousness as we are righteous. What does that mean? It means to cut away the flesh every day. Because that old man is alive. And that old man every day keeps trying to gunk your heart up with the flesh of this world. Every day he's doing that. And every day that we don't do it, it gunks it up more. It gunks it up more. And it gunks it up more. It's like a coffee cup I just saw in there today. I forgot to clean it for three weeks, and it wasn't pretty. <laughs> and I don't want to drink out of it until I clean it. And I take that cup and I clean it thoroughly, a lot, and get all the junk out of it. God can't use you with gunk on your heart. You are a vessel, the Bible says, and you need to be clean so God can use you. Well, how would you like to go to your hammer and it's got grease and junk all over it and you go and swing it and it slides out of your hand? You can't use it properly as it was intended. You have to first clean it off. That, that principle is biblical. Foreskins, uncurtailed, needless. You know why we, they cut the flesh off? It's needless, it's useless. It's in the way of operation. And the same thing is true in the spiritual life. Why do we cut the flesh out of our life? It's useless. It's not going to help you accomplish anything for the glory of God. Get it out. Of your heart. The Hebrew there. So cut it off the flesh of your heart. Feelings of the will and intellect, the center of everything. It's a, it's a choice. To cut the flesh away from your life the simple desires is a choice. It is a feeling of the will that gets stronger every time we get in the Word of God, every time we study the Word of God, every time we understand the Word of God, your heart gets stronger. Your feelings become stronger. Your intellect becomes stronger. And instead of battling with it 
It's, it's not a decision. You're out of here. You're out of here, flesh. I'm not even going to argue with you. I'm not even going to waste time with you. It says we regularly cut away the foreskins, the flesh of our heart. It grows us into a more powerful believer. Circumcision fulfilled in the New Testament. Colossians 2.11 in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with Him through faith of the operation of God, who hath raised Him from the dead. Romans 2, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written, For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law, but if thou be be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Basically, what that is saying, there, right here, therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? It, therefore, if uncircumcision, those that aren't saved, keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Remember, the Jews were saying, you have to be physically circumcised to be saved, and then be saved. And Paul was saying, no, that's an Old Testament principle, I'm talking about the circumcision of the heart. And he's saying there's Gentiles now accepting Christ, who are not physically circumcised, but they're obeying the principles of the Bible about circumcision. He's saying they're circumcised in the heart even though they're not physically circumcised. Okay? You understand what's going on here? There's a battle going on. The Judaizers are trying to link physical circumcision with this new thing coming on that Paul's preaching, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he said, no, 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 no. Circumcision of the heart is not the same as circumcision of the flesh. They're just used to explain one another. So a Gentile, or anybody that's saved now, a Jew even, Circumcision means nothing physically now in the church age. It's the circumcision of the heart that matters, the spiritual circumcision. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter of circumcision does transgress the law? And he's saying, you guys, you guys that are circumcised, doesn't, shouldn't that teach you automatically that what you're doing is wrong? That the circumcision is not about the physical circumcision, it's about the circumcision of the heart that Jesus Christ gives. Your physical circumcision should be a testimony to you that Jesus is the one who circumcises our heart. For He is not a Jew which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. I am a spiritual Jew. Why? Because if it wasn't for Jesus, who was a Jew, I wouldn't have salvation. But the Jewish people failed to fulfill the Great Commission, so they were brought into blindness, and the responsibility to share the gospel was now given to the church, so I am grafted into the tree, which was the Jew. But salvation today comes through Christ. It's inward. It's not outward. But He is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, the physical circumcision, whose praise is not of men, but of God. People are going around saying, I'm physically circumcised, so I'm better than you. Paul's saying, no, no. That's just to show you that what Jesus did to your heart was what is real. And that should be a testimony that you're not doing what you should be doing. You don't understand circumcision is what Paul was saying. Finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the circumcision. The people who try to tell you that you need to do physical things to come into a relationship with God. Someone who tells you that you have to be physically circumcised to come into a relationship with God, he's saying beware of them. He calls them dogs. He calls them evil workers. And anybody out there in Christendom who tells you that you can come to God by anything of the flesh, by any works that you can do, the Bible calls them a dog. He calls them an evil worker. I don't do good to be saved. I do good because I'm saved. And I want my life to be a testimony 
A powerful testimony. And I want to make sure my circumcised heart stays clean of the flesh every day, like Paul said, I die to self daily. It's a daily renewal of heart and mind. And I'll close. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Spiritual circumcision is an operation of God. It's not, it's not an operation of the will. It's an operation of God. And something supernatural happens that only God can understand, explain one day. But it says in the Word of God, when you truly believe in your heart, that old heart that's covered in flesh, that's sinful, that, that doesn't want to understand God, but comes to a point and says, you know what? I believe. I believe Jesus is God. I've studied it out. There's too much evidence. I mean, there's even 500, there over 500 witnesses that Jesus resurrected and went to heaven. People saw Him after He died historically. It's written in history. People saw Him after He was dead. Not just in the Bible, but in history. Pontius Pilate has gone on record saying he saw Jesus after His death. And you say, I believe that. And it's not a bad thing to study it out. It's not a bad thing to say, well, I don't believe it, so I'm going I'm to prove to myself through history that I don't believe it's Jesus. Well, do that. I encourage you to do that. Tell, tell people, do it, please. Because there's a movie being heard getting ready to come out that was out when we were kids, but it's coming out again. And the people who wrote that movie wrote it. They were unbelievers. And they wrote that movie with the intention of disproving Jesus. But by the end of the movie, there was so much evidence to prove Jesus was who He said He was that every one of them accepted Christ. And that's why you see the scene at the end of Ben-Hur the way you do about Jesus on the cross and His blood. Because they came to know Christ. They didn't believe it, but they truly searched it out. They just didn't say they searched it out. They, they searched it out. And they, they, they believed. It's too much evidence that the Bible is true. So, the goal this week is to... View your heart as a coffee mug. And do you want to drink out of a clean coffee mug? Or do you want to drink out of a coffee mug that's got junk in it? And then think of your life to God. Does God want to use your life as you're living it in that day? Yes? Great. No? Clean it up. Get the flesh out. So that's the goal this week is to keep that heart as clean as you possibly can. Why? So you can go to heaven better? No. So you can have a powerful witness whenever that opportunity presents itself. Let's pray.